Batman, welcome back. Uh, we're making this a, a very fun habit. We get to do our first podcast just before the season starts. Nashville 2024, come and gone. What was your take on the show? Uh, I thought it was actually a pretty good show. Um, I've actually been quite impressed with it moving from Vegas. Um, I think scaling it down actually has been kind of nice from what it has been, uh, you know, getting back to the roots of what SCI was and which is hunting and fishing, you know, conservation. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of going to these conventions, especially like when I was in Vegas and, you know, you, you got 17 different vendors trying to, you know, get you to buy a case of booze or wine or something mm. goopy and, you know, it just doesn't pertain to the hunting, and and yeah. that's why I come. So you know, the idea of this is is to come to book a hunt, book a fishing trip, um, learn about what's out there. You know, possibly take in. And I, I didn't do it this year, but in the past I have taken in. Uh, <clears throat> you know, some of the um, the speeches and stuff like that that they that you're you can join in on um you know like we talked about at dinner last night craig boddington yeah. things like that um you know there's always there's always some really good information that you can learn at these shows as well so for a person who doesn't know a lot about different things um you know hunting in a different country or something of that nature this is where you need to come and that's why coming to them as i think is very very important if you want to start branching outside of the country to do more hunts you can mm. one you can book it two you can learn about where you're going you yeah. know there's always going to be somebody here that knows a heck of a lot more than than you need to really know about that place mm. that you're going to go to smaller though eh? felt very much smaller <clears throat> it felt um i actually i kind of liked it in a sense because this will be my first show from having the perspective of work, walking around but I felt uh, it was a lot smaller, but a lot more intimate. There were a lot, there were, it seemed like there were a lot more conversations going about, and it, it, it made it an easier approach for people coming into the outfitter's booth and making the conversation and stuff, So, which is always a good thing, I guess. Yeah, and I do think, again, and that's also that has to do with getting rid of some of the other stuff that really is not a hunting or fishing or mm-hmm. conservation booth you know um also vegas made it a little bit it's still there's still a pretty good party here mm. you know there's still things to do in the nightlife i mean you can go out and have a good time um th- there's plenty of, of great food great great food in this town um you know I, I do think it is far easier to find an airbnb here uh than it is in vegas uh I don't think, you know, and, and I think you can do it actually fairly cheap. I mean, from your hotel to your Airbnb or whatever, you can you can do that more affordably. Um, and because it's not in Vegas where it is warm all the time and a party town, mm. we don't have, we're not getting the riffraff. Yeah, yeah. And, and by that, I mean, you know, I, I remember, oh gosh, this is probably... I don't know, five or six years ago, um, I'm going through SCI and, and this this guy and his girlfriend are they, they you know they're probably in their late twenties and they're in their hotel robe mm. with on a scooter on a on a handicapped person's scooter, each one of them on one with a bottle of champagne and the little bucket up front, mm. you know ridiculous yeah you know it was just ridiculous you know and i think that's where vegas was taking that and bringing it back you know taking it away from that bringing it to nashville bringing it back right. to the roots so yeah i do think uh that's a very good thing you know as we found out uh last night um they at the end of the show they announced it's going to be back here again next year what's your opinion on that mm. yeah I think it's good. I, I, I think it's good. Um, it, it's a great location. Uh, the only thing that I would ask is, you know, SCI really needs to, they need to stop pissing around. Mm-hmm. You know, stop, stop telling us all these different things that they're going to do. 
you know, um, I, I'm a life member. I'm a life member. I paid my money. I believe in the organization and I believe in what we're doing. Give us, give us some, a little bit of solidification of what we're going to have and when we're going to have it. You know, this, this thing of, you know, when it was in Vegas, then it started to become a monster in Vegas. Then, oh, well, we're going to start, we're going to take this as a traveling show every year. It's going to be in a new location. At one point they talked about being in Indianapolis and it's like, you know, you're serious Indianapolis in January. Okay. Well, we should probably just hit Antarctica while we're at it too. You know, and I mean, it's just not a place that you want to go to in the middle of winter. I get Vegas was uh, an animal that created a, a monster, but at the same time, you know, Nashville, uh, it's back yesterday, was absolutely beautiful. Day. Yeah. You know, you're going to have some cold days. You're going to have some warm days. It's, I think it's well located in that sense. But then, you know, you turn around to like the one thing that they were saying was uh, we're going to go two years in, in Nashville. And that was kind of the last solidification that they had was two years Nashville. And then we're going to go two years in New Orleans. Mm. Well... We already started planning out things. Yeah. We were looking at, okay, what can we do next year? We know it's going to be in January. So we walked through and we hit booths uh, for people who had hunts and fishing trips and all those kinds of things in those areas that we knew, okay, let's do this. I, you know, we don't even talked about setting up a hunt with uh, a good buddy of mine in Lubbock. And then, you know, either going to Lubbock first and doing a little hunt and then coming down to New Orleans. Sure. Yeah. And then go to, you know, New Orleans, back to, back to Arizona or however it was going to be. But we, we had started to make plans. We understand that it's a year in advance. Um, but to, to help the people who are coming from other countries that want to come to this show and either sell at this show or attend this show or anything else, they too need to have plans of where it's going to be, when it's going to be, so they know they can investigate what's there. This is not some place you you can't go to this show and say, "Well, hey, what's in New Orleans?" Yeah, you know what I mean. You, you don't. There's nobody here telling you where you can rent something. What's a good section of town? Stay out of that bad section of town. You know those types of things. So you you have to do your investigation, and and the year is is even pushing that a little mm. bit. So to take that away from that, it does. Give me a little bit of animosity because we had already planned it. Yeah. We started that plan. We were focusing on, we even, you know, we're looking at buying hunts and fishing trips for that. Down that area. Yeah. And now scratch that. We're back to, you know, we're going back to Nashville. Just tell us what you guys are doing. That's, that's all we're really asking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that's fair. Yeah, I, yeah. I do think it's fair. Mm-hmm. You know, even if they would have said something two months ago, that would have been better. Mm-hmm. You know, don't let us come to the show and tell us at the last day that, hey, we'll see you next year. We're coming back to Nashville. Mm-hmm. What about the people who didn't didn't attend Saturday? They came Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they left town on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Now, they don't know, and they're going to have to wait for that to come out in a publication. Yeah, press, you know? yeah, press, but um, do you think that's been part of one of the big parts of, of the success of the Dallas Safari Club is they're based in Dallas, you know, that every year, for some of us, it takes two years to plan. So we know now for the next two years, okay, well, now it's a little bit different because moves up to Atlanta while they refurbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah a little bit of a different situation there. But on, on a normal basis, do you think that will be one of the success stories of why um, BSC is so successful? I do. I think everyone knows where it's at every single time. They know what to expect. They know the the layout of the hall. Obviously, you know, the K Bailey's being torn down and they're going to rebuild it. Mm. Um, it's going to take two years and that's why they're moving. When the new hall, I'm actually very excited for that because I, I do like the Dallas Safari Club show. Mm. I, I, I think the convention is, uh, it's, it, it too can be, it can be very cold in Dallas mm-hmm. that time of year. And it can also be very nice that time in Dallas. There's, there's a, a multitude of things that you can do in and around that area. Um, so if a person were to come in and stay, you know, especially, you know, 
you, you know, you guys, you guys are the ones that always are my my thought process because you know you, you have the the foreign people that are coming in to sell a hunt, and sometimes these these shows are right on top of each other, and sometimes they're spaced out. You know where there's a little bit of time in between, so you can kind of take something in mm -hmm. and then hit the next show. Um, this year was was actually I think we're what like damn near a month was yeah. the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, because they they moved Dallas. Dallas was supposed to be the beginning of it, and I think it was actually on the fourteenth. Yeah, we were off. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was supposed to be like the I think around the fifth, sixth, or something. They bumped it back to the fourteenth, fifteenth, or thirteenth, fourteenth, or something of that nature. Um, so it still was about two weeks away, but you know, you, you have one of the largest, uh, livestock shows and rodeos mm -hmm. in the, in the country is right there in Fort Worth. So you have entertainment, you yeah. know, there's, there's still good entertainment. Um, I feel bad for them taking it to Atlanta. I, I'm not really, really sure what Atlanta is going to have to offer, you know, this this group and this crowd of people, um, I, I don't see that as being that that type of crowd. They'll make do for two years. They'll be back to Dallas, and it'll be great. And it and that's where it's at. I mean, yeah. you know, it's the same thing with uh, you know Harrisburg. You know, the Great American. It's always in Harrisburg. It's always been in Harrisburg. It'll always be in Harrisburg. Mm. Um, you know, Houston. Uh, was it the Houston Safari Club or whatever they call themselves? Um, it's always in Houston, you know, having something to where they're, like I said, that solidification of where it's at is a good thing. I mean, we started attending SCI, uh, dad and I, geez, I think we started attending in like around 2006, I think it was 2006 or 2007 we started attending and we, we hit it quite a few times. I mean, it was, it's. You know, it's not a terrible drive for us to get up to mm -hmm. Reno, you know, about an 11-hour drive or something of that nature. So it was still nice. It was actually a very doable show then. You know, um, it obviously, it was much, much smaller back then as mm -hmm. well. Um, and then, in, like I said, moving on to Vegas, yeah. it became a monster. Um, but they stand for first four hunters, right? Yes. I've always wondered why they've never taken the – the idea or the proposal and actually if, if you look around those halls the majority of the people I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the outfitters or the the people that are at the show uh, that have got boots at the shows but the guys that come and visit there should be some sort of ballot or something that they could vote for where they would like it to be because majority of those people that come there on a constant basis have been coming like you said for years and years and years so they'll know where their personal preference would be. So having like a voting system, because I somehow think that even if they did move it down to New Orleans, I wonder what the thought process was about that, you know? Well. Are they trying to fill up you, where their chapters are? Or? Well, and, I, and, and that's very possible that they are trying to hit it where chapters are. Um, you know, to be honest with you, one of the items that's, that is always – just mystified me on that as well. Okay, you, you've got you've got an organization that is built off of members, and you give your members pretty much no input mm. um, on on what we would like to see. Mm. You know, um, it's almost like, hey, let's throw this out there, and then when they get enough backlash, they change it. Yeah, you know, um, we saw that with one of the shows where. I mean, we were literally going to have to go from Dallas uh, to Reno, I believe it was at that time, because it was still in Reno. But we we had we had like two or three days. We had two or three, four days, something mm -hmm. of that nature, that. to drive across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, when you're loading up a booth and you've just spent three, four days, five days doing this show, mm -hmm. and do that, drive across country, and then do it all over again. Uh, and it puts the hurts on some people. Oh, yeah. um, you know, it, it, I think it also it also hurts the the people who are going to go because you know I can take with my business I can take you know four or five days here 
And then two or three weeks later, I can do four or five days over here. I can take two long weekends. But I can't really burn two full weeks back to back going to two different shows. So I have to choose Uh which one am I going to do. And they both do offer different things. You know, I mean, Dallas is a hell of a show. Mm. Um, But they offer... Well, obviously, a hell of a lot more Texas hunts than they do South African hunts. Mm. Um, If I'm going to book the really obscure stuff around the world, Croatia, you know, um, Turkey and all these stand countries that you have out there, um, you you really basically have to kind of come to SCI Mm. because you're going to hit four or five. You know, we were looking for... Uh, we were looking for roe deer, uh, mudjack, and Chinese waterbuck. Um, you know, in this particular show, this time we saw three different people. Um, I, I've seen, you know, unfortunately in Dallas, I've seen that only be one. Mm. You know, and, and now you don't have an option. You know, and it's always good to have that. Yeah, that comparison, you learn something a little more from one person to the other. You know, having having that option to choose from who you feel the most comfortable with is is far better. And and that's where SCI, when you're going outside of the country, I think SCI does a little better for us because there's more options there okay. and more information. You may still see one or two of those same things at Dallas. It's just not more of it. Mm. So when I'm buying something, I want to have options. What um, for the people that don't know, what what is ACI? What is Dallas Safari Club? What does it stand for? What does it do? Um, I know it's an organization, and I know they it's meant to look after the hunters. But but what what is the actual purpose of these organizations? Well, obviously conservation, um, conservation and preservation. Mm. Um, first and foremost, we're, we're conserving our natural resources and, and animals, you know mm-hmm. I mean? Um, but we're also, we're preserving our traditions mm-hmm. and our ways of life and, and what we came from, that, that preservation of the hunter mm-hmm. is, must, it absolutely must be, uh, at the forefront of our mind, mm-hmm just as conservation is because what good is it going to do to con- to to keep this conservation and keep these animals you know keep that portion of hunting alive if you're not going to have anybody to hunt mm. the hunter is what what goes after these these game and 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 it's a hand wash situation on that because you know without that hunter you would have never had a, we we've talked about this and Forgive me if I'm wrong on the actual animal, but I believe it was the sable. Um, and I, 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 sable was one of them, and I, I think wildebeest was another one. Were the numbers, the, the black wildebeest, correct? Black wildebeest, yeah. it, 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 like, just decimated, absolutely decimated. And and it was because of conservation and, and groups like Dallas Safari Club and mm-hmm. and SCI and, and you know, whether it be FAZA, I don't remember who all was involved in the thing, but... Uh, People coming together and saying, look, you know, if we don't do something, this animal is going to go away and we're not going to get it hunted. And and that's the one thing that, and this all ties in, and this is where we have to be super careful because this ties into the anti-hunting as well. Mm. You know, these anti-hunters, they pump a ton of money into saving animals, but what they don't realize is the amount of money that they're pumping into it most of it gets wasted, okay? And on top of it, they're uneducated in what they're doing. Mm. You know, you can't just simply say, let's save the animal because you end up with things uh, where you have overpopulation, uh, chronic wasting disease, and white-tailed deer because there's not enough hunters. There's not enough, there's not enough being done to l- keep those numbers down. Um, in fact, you know, oddly enough, I don't know if I told you this, uh, I just heard about this in Michigan. If I if I if if I have this one hundred percent correct for next year next year, if you hunt a buck, they're giving you two doe tags, and 
they're they're requiring you but not requiring you to fill those tags they're 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 expecting you to fill that tag without requiring you to fill that tag so basically they're just telling, they're telling you there's too many animals mm -hmm. and when you end up with too many animals then you end up with starvation chronic wasting diseases things of this nature and that too can be just as bad for the animal as as being depleted so you know everything has to have a balance and without that hunter and not without preserving the hunt what good does it do to conserve the animals mm -hmm. you know um you must absolutely must conserve that animal it, it protection on the animal protection of the hunter you know and we're never going to get through to the majority of the non-hunters because they are so adamant that that hunting is so bad mm. when when the you know the attributes are there that they would just open their eyes and say look this is what we can have this is what this should be we'd be in good shape i mean the the <laughs> they go down to the store down here they go down to whole foods down here and they and they they spend 15 dollars a pound mm. on on organic beef when every damn deer out there is organic mm. And, and probably far more organic than what you would get out of the beef. And it, you, you're, you're more hands-on with that process, which, you know, some people don't like it. And that's fine. You know, I understand, you know, some people have a hard time in taking life and that, that sort of thing, too. But, but you're also able to, to pick who, who's going to process my meat. You know, um, you know, like I said, Jake Gwynn and I went up and did this moose hunt. Um, with uh, Eacha Mountain and British Columbia in November. Brought our meat back, dropped it off in Coeur d'Alene. I, I went with uh, Charlie Daly's recommendation, hey, use this guy. Um, Scott, I think it was Scotty's, mm -hmm. Scotty's meat, meat um, or butchering, or Scotty's butchering, something of that nature. Phenomenal. Jeez, you, you've had it? Yeah, that sausage yeah, you, we had was... The really sausages good. the guy made is out of bounds, you know, and, and he's just... They're just a little mom and pop operation that you would never know. And that food is out of bounds. And I guarantee you, you know, I'm sure it has happened at some point in time that, that some person has gotten E. coli out yeah. of a mom and pop place because somebody wasn't clean or that nature. But look at the, the full scale of the E. coli breakouts and the salmonella breakouts and all that in these mass production plants. You know, which one do you want? You can, you can still get organic, mm. but it's going through a plant. Mm. And you could still end up with E. coli. Well, why, why has no one ever challenged the decision to process and then resell game meat here in the country? Yeah, and, that's, and that's, you know, to going back to these organizations, that's something I think SCI and Dallas Safari Club would have tried to do as best as they possibly can. Because if you look at it from a larger scale, do you think their opinion is it will hurt the hunting industry a little bit more or will it actually benefit it? I don't – no, I don't think it would ever hurt the industry whatsoever. I, I really, truly don't think it would hurt the industry. I think it would actually benefit the industry. Um, when you When you open up – the game market to people who have never had game. Um, it's really hard. It's very, very hard because we're, we're given these from the time where we can start watching TV, we're bombarded with these liberal mm -hmm. television spots and, you know, uh, Disney, you know, Mm. Disney, Disney's the worst, the worst of the worst. I mean, you take, you know, you, you watch Bambi. Oh my God, they killed Bambi's mom. You know, mm. you know no, no, that's not how that works. Mm. You know, that's not how that works. And and actually, if you watch the story of Bambi, the, the guy's not even a hunter; he's a poacher. Mm. You know, that's not hunting, mm. but yet it's branded as hunting, and it, and it gives us that bad side. But everybody thinks, oh my God. I'm eating mm. Bambi. Mm. I'm eating Bambi's mom. And, and it's the thought process of eating something that you can relate a character to mm. or something of that. Or a fluffy bunny, you know. 
you know, we talked about this. One of the healthiest meats you can eat is rabbit. Mm. And rabbit is absolutely great meat. Um, you know, we, I've told you before, we used to raise show rabbits and that kind of stuff. Well, the type of rabbit that we raised was, was, a uh, it was kind of a dual purpose rabbit. They, they were bred for their fur and for their meat production. Um, and we ate a lot of rabbit, and it was extremely, extremely healthy for you, very good for you, very versatile. And guess what? The rest of the world eats rabbit. You can get it on a menu. Hmm. You can sit down in Spain two day, two night, and have rabbit hmm. in a restaurant. But you know what? You can't in America because, oh, oh geez, that's thumper. Oh, my God. No, we're eating Thumper. Oh, my. we're eating the Easter Bunny. Oh, my God. We're eating the Easter Bunny. You know, <laughs> you know you, it, no, it, it puts that, that thought yeah. process in your head that you can't eat that. Mm. And, and yes, you can. Yes, you can eat that. Um, you know, uh, there's a few of the guys out there, and I, I, I don't – I'm not going to do it. If they so choose to do it, so be it. But the <laughs> – there's been a lot of talk on Facebook about a few of these guys that are actually, they're eating coyote. Um, they're shooting coyotes and eating coyotes. And uh, that one I can't do. Um, the coyote just to me is just too much, just too much of a scavenger. I, I can't mm. do it. Um, that being said, I don't, I probably, I don't know if I would eat a wolf. I suppose, you know, they, they tend to bring down their game a little bit more. I, but, but the purpose of hunting those animals is for a different reason. Also. Yeah, it is, 100%. 100%. You know, um, but, it, but that's the, it's the stigmata of what this is, and that's how yeah. that is. To be honest with you, like going, getting back to the question, do I think it would actually help? I do, I do think it would help if we would open this up and stop this, because there are places, uh, Buck... The Buckhorn, it's the Buckhorn restaurant in, in Denver, Colorado. Um, they serve a multitude of game. Uh, you can get venison, elk, buffalo. Uh, we had buffalo steak the other night. Yeah, that's what you I was going to say. Yeah. Pretty damn good, wasn't it? <laughs> so, the best meat to be yeah, had. Yeah, it's fantastic <laughs> meat. Um, so, you know, they, I know that they were serving ostrich um, it seems like you can get rabbit in there as well. I, I don't remember, but there's a, there's a multitude of, of wild game that you can eat. And once people start to realize, Hey, I can't eat this. Then they, 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 they open their, their mindset and forget about what they're eating mm. and they run with it. And, and, you know, and <laughs> the real true sad part about it is if you really think about this, the, the one person who gives the a, a damn the most about an animal living and dying really is the hunter you know you, you see a person uh they hit they hit a deer on the road right you know they're not hunters and they're like oh i hit this deer oh gosh dude you know, they drive off they continue with their day you know it dampened their day i drive by that same deer and i'm like oh my god because I see what that animal represents in mm. population, mm. you know, especially in our area of Prescott, you know, the mule deer, you know, it's, it's already an animal that is not as prolific as like the white tail and the elk and that kind of thing. And to see a dead mule deer laying alongside the road, you know that that represents three or four or five or six mm. offspring that are never going to, yeah. never going to take place now because that animal is laying there dead. Yeah. So we tend to be more sorrowful about that, knowing the life cycle of what's happening there. Um, also, I think I think that would push the government to, into allowing more more of these game farms to come in, and I think be managed more properly. That we don't end up with game farms that have chronic wasting disease because you know there's there's 800 elk in a five acre pen or something of that nature. I mean that's a little bit exaggerated, but you know I've been past some game farms where they they are very much overpopulated, and you're going to end up you're going to end up with with a chronic <laughs> wasting in that issue. Um, you know, but if if more people and and you 
to be honest with you, that's where you're actually seeing is in the buffalo. Mm. You are seeing it in the buffalo, and you're starting to see it in elk now. Elk is starting to show up on menus in a lot of places. Just quick one, Pat, when, you say, when you say buffalo, you mean bison, right? Bison, yeah. yes. Yeah, American bison. So, um, so that, that, you know, that American bison buffalo, if you will, um, it's, it's in a lot. It became a big, big movement. And that, that happened back in the early 2000s, uh, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. You started to see that shift where people stopped seeing them as the big fluffy cow mm. in Yellowstone. Um, they, they became a food source, mm. you know, and I mean, for God's sakes, uh, Ted Turner, mm. you know, one of, one of the country's biggest liberals owns two ranches, one in Montana, one in New Mexico, since divorcing the illustrious Jane Fonda, mm. um, he is now allowed hunting to take place on these ranches. Uh, and then they hunt elk and buffalo and bison all, all across these ranches. And he's also serving him in his two restaurants that he owns, one right here in Nashville. You know, if somebody wants to come to Nashville next year, you and I had it. It's quite good. It's um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great experience. And uh, to me, I, I believe it was 45 bucks for mm-hmm. like a 14-ounce ribeye. And it was absolutely superb. I don't think you could have got a better meal anywhere else. Um, so a little bit more money than a beef, but it was absolutely superb. And you can taste the difference in them. You know, most people, if you wouldn't have told them that it was buffalo or bison, they would have not ever realized that it was. But, mm. and it was, like I said, in the late 90s and early 2000s, that's where you saw that switch in that um, and, and I saw it in the hunting side of it because I started to notice that the hunts on buffalo started to go up mm. and there became less and less hunts available. Mm. And we ended up hunting uh, just outside of Grand Island, Nebraska. And I was talking to the guy that was guiding us and he says, you know, I said, well, you know, how, how, how do you do this? I, you know, why, why'd you get into this Buffalo hunt thing? And he goes, well, my granddad was actually a cattle farmer. And he said, with all the trouble with cattle farms and everything else, you know, um, you just don't get any money for the cattle, you know, and then they don't, the farmer and the rancher does not get the money that the, the meat producers do after slaughter. It's all the middlemen in between. And mm-hmm. the, the, that's yeah. where the money's going. It's not to the rancher or farmer. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, this, we can control this ourselves because we're more specialized. And he said, you know, you know, I'm taking a beef cow and he says, I'm getting 91 cents a pound on the hoof. And he says, I'm taking a buffalo bison or a bison uh, bull. And he says, I'm, I'm getting, you know, 250. And this was back in 2000 and Gosh, that would have been 2003, four, somewhere in that nature. Okay. Okay. Um, But he still loved to hunt them. So he kept a a section of land, 660 acres, a square mile. Yeah. And it was heavily wooded. It was actually a really fun hunt. It really was a fun hunt because he kept it very natural in there. And it was a hunt. It, Mm -hmm. It was fun. It wasn't a huge piece of property, but it was big enough to make it a hunt. Um, unfortunately hunting buffalo is pretty much most of the time just a shoot. Yeah. Um, so the, when you're, when you're hunting a buffalo, you, you really kind of drive out cause they, they're really not afraid of anything. They're just mm-hmm. going to stand there, you pop them. So, um, but he's the one that told me how that swing was. And now I've watched it over the last 20 years and, you know, we used to be able to shoot. My dad shot a, a, I believe that was a 10 year old. I think it was a 10 year old bull. Big, massive son of a gun. Huge, massive. It was around 2,000 pounds on the hoof. And, and he shot that. In a, and, and he was actually just a touch more than the going rate. And it was 5,000. Hmm. That same bull right now would probably cost you at most of these places around here you know, 12 to 18,000 or more, depending on where you go. Um, You know, that's just that that's the popularity. And then also the amount uh, because they're selling these animals to the slaughterhouses now. 
And it's easier for them to get the money. They, we even hunted with a place in Colorado, Elk, Elk Mountain Ranch is the name of the place. And they used to do a ton of buffalo hunts. Mm. And they've cut way, way back on the buffalo hunts because they don't have to do anything. They can load them on a truck and that guy takes them and he takes them and handles all the processing and he still gets 250 a pound. Mm. Whereas, you know, when he was hunting them, he's getting 250 Process as it's laying thing. on the ground. It's still on the hook, but he has to process the animal. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now he's not mm. processing the animal at all. He just loads it on a truck and he still gets the 250. So a lot of these guys are going away from doing the hunting side of it because it's, it's so much more wanted on the meat production side. Um, and I think you can see that, and you are seeing that with elk. And I think we can see a lot more of that with elk. And I think to be, you know, you take Texas into play, um, you know, you bring in access, um, Axis is a fantastic meat. Yeah. Nil guy, another another fantastic meat. Good meat yeah. Oh, you know they they told me they told me with Nil guy that if I ate Nil guy, I'd never eat red meat again. I'd never eat cattle, and it's pretty damn good. Mm. It's pretty damn good, but you're not going to chase me off a T bone. You know, <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Uh, it's pretty damn good. Yeah. But both of them are very good meat. Psycha deer, Sika Sika, however you want to pronounce it. Um, very good meat. So there's, there's a, there's a multitude and especially, especially Texas, my goodness, man. And so many other states around them are starting to see what it's done for Texas. Mm. Missouri has opened it up. Um, there's quite a few game ranches in Missouri, game ranches in Oklahoma, game ranches are starting to happen in New Mexico. Okay. It's happening in Montana, Wyoming, all Colorado, that's why I, I, I ask the question is, are you not scared that it takes away from the traditional side of things, the open land hunting? And oh, it does. It so, does. I mean, that would be my biggest worry of it. But Well, and you've got, and that's the problem, but you're always going to have that portion. And that's where that comes into the preservation of the hunter. We've talked about this before in previous, even in previous podcasts, we've had this. And the preservation of the hunter it starts with us as hunters, mm. okay? Um, it's time to start argue, stop arguing about how we're hunting, what we're hunting, where we're hunting, and all these different things, mm. and get together. Because if we don't get together, they're going to strip us one by one out of what we're doing, okay? And, and that's really it. I mean, you got, I mean, for God's sakes, you, you take these bow guys, you know, Oh my God, are you shooting a recurve? Are you shooting yeah. a compound? Are you shooting mechanicals? Are you shooting fixed blade? Uh, are you shooting a crossbow? Oh, you're a cheater, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, it's, I mean, and the things that I have read in the hunting societies and on Facebook and social media of how these guys tear each other apart. Mm. You know what? If the man wants to use a damn fixed blade at a compound blow, bow, then, then by God, let him do yeah. it. Yeah. That's his. It's not affecting you one mm. bit. It's not. Mm. it's not affecting your hunt. Mm. So let him do his hunt his way. Mm. It doesn't affect you. Back him on his play because if he loses his play, it's just Everyone like our constitutional rights here in this country. When you strip one, one person of their constitutional rights, yours are the next. Mm. Mm. You can't tell this guy no and then expect somebody not to tell you no. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the preservation of hunting. You have to do that. Um, it, it goes, you know, muzzleloader. Mm. You know, oh, is is that, you know, a, a true flintlock? Is that this? And, mm. you know, I mean, it's the same thing. There's there's four or five different types. I mean, Christ, now you even got some of these uh, muzzleloaders that are, that are shooting out a thousand yards. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, but, but, I mean, and... and it's so true what you said because it's happening in the fishing fraternity now in South Africa is where the drone fishing, you know, where the drones yeah, set yeah. the bait out to certain. I, I don't know too much of the backstory of Roundup, but I do know that certain fishing entities are saying, oh, no, but it's cheating, it's this, that, and the next thing. But cracks started developing, and now before they wipe the shit out of their eyes, there could be an issue around the whole fishing fraternity and not just drone fishing anymore. And that's what I worried. Yes. And, and, and a lot of things happen like that, like Cecil. Yeah. The lion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're too worried about bitching and arguing between one another instead of actually focusing on what we need to look after. And yeah. that's the courts hunting, it's conservation. Right. 
and then cracks start forming in these these empty hunters. Yep. They just can get in there and they just want to try and capitalize and they're winning. They're winning yeah. the battle on a constant basis. They can divide us because mm. if they keep us divided, us, we, we cannot stand arm to arm and fight them if we're if we're not standing arm to yeah. arm. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and that's truly it. And, and that goes the same thing. You know, we're talking about not just not just the weapons that we use. Now, I will say, I love to hunt free range. Mm. I do. Anytime I can, I do. Mm. But guess what? Um, there's some animals in this world that you're not going to hunt free range mm -hmm. because it's not possible. It's just not possible to do it because it doesn't exist. Mm. Um, that being said, I, I wouldn't say that you can't hunt a markhor naturally in free roam, but um, I think you'll see, I'm starting to see it now. Actually, the markhors are coming down in price in Texas. Oh, really? Yes, they are. Right, they're, Texas. they're starting to drop in price. Okay. Right now, you, you have to go into a war-torn world. Yeah. And, you know, these places, you know. Because they're based in Pakistan? Well, they're Pakistan, Nepal. Um, there, there's actually about, about six or seven subspecies of the markhor. Um, and they, they are in some really rough, I mean, Afghanistan, mm. you're not going into Afghanistan. I can't yeah. get in there. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can get into Pakistan, but it, I mean, I could lose my life. And mm. it's where, where do you have to draw that line? And of course, then you add on the, the expense of that animal being, you know, to do a hunt on a more core in some of those places is, is still 35 to $50,000. Yeah. That's wow. just for the animal, yeah. you know? So now you got to get yourself there and all the things that go with it. Um, Texas, you know, in Marcor, were, they were up around, I think, thirty five, fifty thousand 50000 to do a high fence. Um, but I think I've seen some now that you're able to go, like, down and around that 25000 And I think as, as they breed them in, and, and again, this goes back to sable. Yeah. This goes back to black wildebeest. I mean, black wildebeest at one point in time, they were $15,000 or more to hunt a black wildebeest. They're four hundred and fifty. Mm. So th that's what's going to happen. And because, because we're conserving and preserving, we're bringing the numbers back. And when the numbers get bigger, the, the supply is more. So the demand mm. is still there, but there's so much supply that now it brings that price down. And it actually is a good thing because once the supply, first of all, can meet the demand and then can exceed the demand, then the prices start to come down and it opens up more hunting for a lot of other people. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to drag my 15 year old <clears throat> daughter into Nepal mm -hmm. and to Kyrgyzstan or any of these other places. Not going to happen. I'm not doing that, but I, I would damn sure take her to Texas. Mm -hmm. And, and I know guys down there that have 1500 to 15,000 acre ranches and I can hunt on those, mm -hmm. you know, um, 1500 is a bit small for me. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not super keen on that. The bigger, the better. You know, I like to give them a little more chance. Um, but it, it's what you, it's what's there. It's how we have to do this. And again, this is some of this stuff is just how it has to be done in order to be able to hunt these uh, scimitar horned oryx, Arabian oryx. You're not going to hunt them in the wild. They, mm -hmm. they, the, the Arabian oryx is almost extinct in the mm -hmm. wild. Mm -hmm. And I think the numbers are under 300 yeah. at this moment. Okay. Texas has around, I think, 8,000 Arabian oryx, okay? So you're going to hunt it in high fence. Now, I'm not saying shoot it in a pen. I'm not saying shoot it in a pen. And I get a lot of people's, you know, mindset that, oh, my God, you're shooting a pen animal. Okay, go into some of these. Open, open your eyes. Investigate it for yourself. Instead of sitting there bitching at the guy and telling him how bad he is and how wrong he is, well, by God, take your ass down there, buy a hunt, and go out there. And if you don't feel right, then don't pull the trigger. But I'll, again, I'll guarantee you, once you've seen some of these ranches and how tough that hunt is, you'll be like, oh, you know what? It's a pretty good hunt. It's also, you know? Like you said, it's, it's, it's more for the bigger picture. I mean, like you said, you're not going to take the risk into going into Nepal or the Congo, Antibango, oh, or yeah. anything like that. And and yes, you can argue one that that it takes away from the the full experience, but 
the bigger picture is that if, if you're not hunting that Arabian oryx in Texas, if no one's hunting that, what, There's what no incentive to does he have to keep them around? There's not. And at, at some point along the line, I want my daughter to see an Arabian oryx, mm -hmm. I, whether she's hunting it or not. I yep. want her to be able to see able it. And to if see you it. aren't looking after it. Because it's a beautiful animal. It's a magnificent animal. Yeah, you know? beautiful, beautiful animal. And, you know, and, and, there, and the thing is, is there's, there's even, most zoos don't even have them. Mm. Most, people, maybe most people look at an, uh, uh, a scimitar, if you were to, if you even had an Arabian horse, most people associate it more with a scimitar. Yeah. And they think they're looking at a scimitar. They're not. No, completely they're different. They're completely yeah. different, but that's yeah. what they think there is because they're not educated enough to yeah. know that there is an Arabian oryx. Yeah. And again, education. Mm. You know, <clears throat> that's where, and that's, that is the one thing, you know, SCI touts, we need to educate. We're education, education, education. And they do. They, they put on a multitude of, of speeches. I've sat in on the Craig Boddington's and the, you know, the, the Shockey and other people and whatnot. I've sat in on these, on these speeches and these talks to, to educate myself. On, you, on you, don't, you don't think that's the problem. But it, that. well, because they, they're communicating to, to the fellow hunters, which majority of them by now have got the full experience. You see, one of my biggest, one of my biggest things is as I like to call myself a conservationist, but one of my biggest things is, is that I, I, I get disheartened and I get a little bit um, taken back by if an anti-hunter kind of labels me as uncompassionate about what we do, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, I, 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 I'll, I'll be the first person to admit it. I hate taking anything's life, any animal's life, yep. I hate it. It's yep. not about that. It's about, for me, the bigger picture at the end of the day, like you said, and it's about the adventure. It's about the journey. It's about the experience. And I want to live a much healthier life with mm -hmm. the meat and all that sort of stuff. But <clears throat> if I turn around and I tell a fellow hunter that, he'll, he'll understand me. But it's the education that we've got to take and it's the point we've got to take. And that's why I hope like a lot of non-hunters actually listen to these podcasts because if I'm educating them around that side of the, the curve, then more people are going to understand, well, hang on, maybe these guys are a little bit more compassionate. Maybe they're all Oh, damn sure. Yeah. I mean, man, I've never, I've never felt... I've never felt really good about myself and killing an animal. Mm. If, you, if you, you, you can feel good about the experience of being where you're at and all those things. But if, if, you, if you find joy in killing something, mm. you're murder. it's a little bit different there. That, that's a different human being, you know. You know that, that I think they call them sociopaths. You know, I mean, <laughs> okay, that's that's different, okay. But you know, I, 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 you know, two years, almost three years ago now, almost died from COVID. We all know that, okay. Mm -hmm. And two and a half months later, I was climbing down the side of a mountain in Spain, and you know, for those who don't know me, and I'm six three. Um, I am a big man. I'm, I'm about 340 pounds. Okay. Um, I'm still, you know, bad knees and whatnot on top of it. You know, I've got a left knee that needs to be replaced and I'm descending down the side of a mountain that I can literally stand and stand sideways, put my arm out. And at one point I can touch this, this mountain. Okay. So what are we talking? Three feet, three and a half yeah. feet. So you tell me the degree of angle that mountain was. It was treacherous. It took mm -hmm. me it took me an awful long time to get down the side of this mountain, and it took me a hell of a longer, long, longer to get back up. And I was wore out, um, laying on a cliff in bushes, and and I shoot, I shoot this gr absolutely fantastic Greedo Cybex, um, and I, and but and I was spent. I mean, again, I'm only two and a half months out from being in. In a ICU, ICU unit, oxygen on oxygen. I mean, in high volume oxygen. They actually wanted to put me on a ventilator, but they didn't have one. Mm. So thank God they didn't have a ventilator. I probably wouldn't even made it out of there. Um, 
But two and a half months later, I'm, I'm on the side of this mountain. And I told him, I said, guys, he's further down in the valley. I said, if you guys would, I, I said, with where we're at with the day and everything else, I got to start going back up now. I said, I can go down there to where this animal is at. And we can take pictures and we can do all of this and, and so on and so forth. But I said, I, you're going to have to bring me a tent. I'm going to have to stay there for the <laughs> night. I'm not going to be able to get out <laughs> And they kind of looked at me and they were like, you serious? And I said, I'm, I'm dead serious. I said, I know where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm in, you know, and this is like probably two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and it's winter time. So yeah, yeah. dark at five 30, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm an hour and a half, two hour climb just to get out of this. And then a mile walk back to the vehicle mm. in some really rough terrain. And I said, I got to go. And they said, by all means, go. So they went down to retrieve the animal, skin it, and all do what they needed to do. And I went back. And, and I, I got back to the truck right as pretty much dusk. We saw just a little bit of a glimpse of the sun tucked behind one of the mountains. And we had a, a, be a beautiful sunset. And I sat there on a big rock watching the sun go down. And I was, I was overjoyed. Mm. I was happy. Mm with what everything about that just That's happened, ended, yeah. okay? That I pushed myself and knowing that I, I was in bad shape and I still pushed myself to do what I did. Mm. Um, taking a, a, an absolutely stellar animal, mm. but the actual killing of that animal was not part of that joy. Mm. Everything else was the joy. Yeah. And that's, and that's where these anti-hunters need to understand us, that we're not that way. You know, it, it's, about, it's about how we push ourselves and what we do. Um, you know, I, I, wish, I wish sometimes that they would just come and see, you know. And, and I, I have to give huge props to Stephen Ranella. Uh, meat eater, you know, to, to, to take these people. You know, and, he, and he's always one to say you know what? Why don't you fellas join me? Mm. Why don't you join me? You think you think what I'm doing is so wrong and so easy and this and that. Why don't you come join me? Well, he made one hell of a hunter out of Joe Rogan. Mm. He's made a hell of a hunter out of Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is it, absolutely passionate about hunting now. Mm. Wow. Mm. Because he had his eyes opened mm. for just one brief moment. And he, he was able to say, you know what? I was wrong. This is not what I thought it was. And now he, he is going hunting more and more all the time. And you're starting to see that. I mean, you know, you're seeing it. And I, and I thank God. And I, I, I do at the same time, uh, I worry a bit about famous people hunting. Because I think you're going to get a lot of people, and this this ties in with the one of my other big issues is corporate hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not into this whole corporate hunting thing. You know, where people are using it as a tax write off to go mm -hmm. and take their guys out there to just you know mow things down and stuff. And I, and that to me, it, it, there's some guys that are doing it right, and there's some guys that are doing it yeah, wrong. So. Um, you know, it, it's not about that. That's not what we are. It's not who we are. And there's a lot of famous, you know, professional athletes, movie stars, on and on, that are getting into hunting. Mm. And I worry about their followers getting into this for the wrong reason. Mm. Okay? They're getting it. You know, I mean, for God's sakes, some of these people vote how their their famous icon yeah, yeah, yeah. votes that's how that's how brain dead they are you know <laughs> oh uh, snoop dogg said i should vote for this guy yeah. oh, well, do you know snoop dogg because what works for him doesn't work for you mm. you know i mean it's a different lifestyle don't think for yourself just a little bit and that's what worries me about that i mean you've got uh you know Obviously, Brett Favre was was a big one. I mean, having Brett Favre uh, hunting. He's Brett Favre. Uh, he was a quarterback of uh, the Green Bay Packers. Okay. Okay. Um, he was a big one. Ted Nugent. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, who doesn't know Uncle yeah. Ted, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
having him out there, you know, then having, um, you now I think you're seeing, uh, Oh my goodness. I'm trying to think of, uh, Shaq. We talked about him the other day. Shaq's a hunter. You know, he keeps it low key because he doesn't want to draw the attention to him. And that's, you know, at that same time, I see double edged sword on that because, you know, I appreciate the fact that he's trying not to draw the wrong attention to himself. But also, if he were to find the right outlet and the right people to talk to, maybe take some of those people hunting, they can he could show them what it meant, you know. Well, I think and educate. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's always the the special part of it is that, and and I think that's why Joe has got such a great team behind him with Steve Renella, and yeah. maybe Joe's not the best person to um, reflect or, or project the essence of hunting and the, the backstory about conservation and stuff. Right. But, but his team behind him does it pretty well. So yes. And and I think, you know, I always say if a, if a young professional hunter hits me up on social media or whatever and if I if he says, how does he get in to become a PH and stuff, I'll, I'll ask him a question and i say, well, what is the reason you want to do this for? And if in the first sentence or two there's no mention or understanding of conservation, I kind of deter them away from it because mm-hmm. you've got to understand the basic principles of what being a hunter, being a professional hunter is actually mean. And, and, and conservation doesn't just mean the animal. It can mean the land. I mean, yes, our greatest success conservation, one of our greatest success conservation stories is our land. Is we look after our land for our hunting. And, look, and that's... A, a thousand know. percent. A thousand percent. Mm-hmm. Because you... But it, it, it's, all, it's all circular. It all revolves around each other. I mean, you, you, you can't... You can't conserve or preserve an animal without having the terrain, the the, yeah. the house or the home for that animal to be in. And they're a wild animal. They, they thrive off oh. of range, land. Um, if you don't have the water, you know, and, th- and this is, you know, this is where, you know, you and I have been involved in, in donating hunts to um, the, the Mule Deer Federation, uh, Arizona Elk Society. And these are groups that are, they're seeing that side of that conservation and saying, okay, what do we need to do to this? And, and they put their money where their mouth is. They put the boots on the ground. They get out there and they, they build the water lots. They work with Forest Service. They work with states, whether it be on Forest Service land, state land. And they, they even work on private lands. And they go to ranchers that have big chunks of land and they say, look, you know, let us let us come in and build some water lots for the wildlife, and in turn, you know, you you, you allow some people to come and hunt, mm-hmm. um, and and they're opening that door, to, you know, for a lot of uh, hunters, yeah, who in the past um, have ruined hunting for other hunters on on private properties because you know you, you get some shithead that goes out and he shoots the water tank because he thinks it's fun, well. It's the desert, you know? I mean, to see water pissing out the side of a tank, yeah. I, I don't know what joy you get out of that, yeah. but that's what our that's what our livestock, that's what our our animals are drinking here, you know? Our, mm. our wild animals and our domesticated animals are drinking that water. Don't shoot the tank. Don't tear up the man's land. And, you know, and there again, that's where education, mm. you know, they're educating people on, you know, guys, you see these things. This is This is what we can do. And, well, you know, believe it or not, I don't know if I've ever told you. I mean, um, we were actually hired by, um, I think it was funded through Arizona Game and Fish and the U.S. Forest Service. We built trick tanks back in, in the woods. A um, and a trick tank is basically, there's, there's multitudes of ways you can do a trick tank. But a trick tank, we went in, we built a great big, huge brown tank, water tank. And then we built a roof over top of that, but we inverted the roof. So it's a huge, huge roof that goes all the way around oh, this so tank. It okay. And it captures the rain that falls, and it, it inverts it back down into mm-hmm. that tank and holds that water. And then there's, you know, float systems on the tanks and things like that that allow that to, to feed it off into for the cattle and for the wildlife and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. um, you know, you, you see a lot of... Yeah, 
I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the ones. There's a lot of them that they actually lay big, big sections right down on the ground. They're the easiest to make because you can you can go in and you can clear a little piece of land and lay stuff down. You don't have to erect anything, but you can lay it down and it runs down a hill. You know, and it'll take uh, sheet metal. Um, I've seen them in concrete, old ones in concrete where they poured great big, huge slabs of concrete mm. and that water would run down funnel into a tank that was further down the hill. And then further down the hill was the actual watering system for the wildlife. Um, but some of these things were the size of, you know, an acre. Well, mm. an acre of habitat gone is an acre it's of habitat gone. Enough, yeah. So building something up off the ground, you know, um, eh. And, you know, you know, again, I, I, I am all for changing the world, but we have to do everything smart. And, th and this is where the stupidity of people overrides common sense uh, by, the, by the few um, that we just can't get our way pushed through. I mean, man, look, look at the solar fields. Look at the land. And it's starting to be, to be talked to now. Because the amount of land that they're having to take and, and destroy mm. to put in a solar field, that habitat, you, you, how many animals have you displaced? Mm. I, think, I think in a one-acre garden, if, if, you, if you tear up a one-acre plot, I, I can't remember what it boils down to. It's like X amount of rabbits, X amount of mice, all this. I mean, and you start to look at what the death toll is. So even if you're a damn vegetarian... Mm. You've destroyed the habitat for an animal and you've displaced them, mm. you know? So don't, don't think that what you're doing is great. There, we have to do everything properly, educatedly in order to move forward. And, and again, I think, you know, like I said, trying to the trick tank and the solar fields, those are things that can take up a great deal of land. So, but that water's necessary. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely yeah. necessary. Build the trick tanks. Get them up off the ground to where we can capture above um, something of that nature and, and still have habitat underneath them. And, and not only that, but uh, we also found that in having these trick tanks with the inverted, inverted roofs, um, when, it, when it was quite hot, you would actually find a lot of wildlife would come in and, and use it as shade. Said, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> they, would, they would, or shelter from rain, you know, if it was yeah, hailing, cool. snow, all these different things. They, they would use it as a shelter as well. So, I mean, that even though you're just taking a bit of land away from them, you know, they it's still use that roof system as yeah. one. Whereas, like, the big sheet of concrete on the ground, it's just a sheet of concrete. Yeah. They, can't, they can't utilize it for nothing other than the, the little bit of water. So, you know, we need to find out what works best and, and do that. Utilizing. Yes, mm -hmm. without a doubt. But um, just shifting over a little bit... Uh, <laughs> I saw I saw you stopping in a couple of booths this past week. What's your plans for the year? What have you got coming up? Ah, uh, um, well, starting in March uh, for Lily's spring break, we're going to go up to Idaho. We're going to do the Snake River, uh, do a little sturgeon, okay, fishing. Um, then uh, I'm returning back to BC with Stuart um, in May. What you gonna hunt down there? We're gonna do black bear. Okay. Um, I did my black bear with him last year. Um, taking Lily up to do a black bear with her. Um, I'm actually gonna return with him again in in November <laughs> and do a white tail. And the the mule deer is opportunistic. So if a if a mule deer presents itself then i can do a meal what's, his, what's his offering company uh each a mountain, each a mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um super nice guy yeah. um it, it's a uh, it's rustic it's rustic it's not a and, you know he does offer actually some horseback tent country hunts and stuff like that but um i think i'm past that in my life <laughs> <laughs> you know he hit 52 and it kind of yeah you know, uh, you know what <laughs> i don't know if i want to sleep on the ground anymore so, um, but he's got some really nice cabins and, you know, you go out and you do your hunt and there's always good food, you know, home cooked food ready for you. Are you hunting, uh, the bear off bait or with dogs? No, uh, the bear is actually spot and stock. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So last year, um, when, was it, when is this? This is May, 
Oh, so you it's guys coming into May. spring, huh? Yeah, they're coming out of hibernation. And okay. I actually went up last year. And when I went last year, um, he I was the first. I was in the first week, so it opens May first, and I was the first hunter. Okay. And um, there was a a brother and a sister actually joined me about two days later. Um, they drove up from from Spokane around the Spokane area. Um, you know, they'd hunted a year or two earlier to retrieve a a mounted bear and then they also bear hunted as well and uh it was still a lot of snow on the ground and mm. the lakes were still frozen okay yeah so um it was it was a very very late winter going in up there um so it actually was a little bit tougher than what it normally would yeah because the grass just and you know when they're coming out of hibernation they're eating the grasses mm. and that kind of stuff um and we still saw a, a great deal of animals. I mean, absolute great deal of animals. Um, actually, got to see a wolverine nice. in the wild, and that that you know that that was that was probably the coolest thing about the hunt, and and everything about the hunt was cool. But that was probably my most favorite thing was seeing a wolverine because the chances of seeing a wolverine is just mm. ah, it's like seeing a ghost. You yeah. just don't see him, you know. Um, so good to see that uh, the bear, the the one bear that I shot, he actually is. A, it's a two bear area because they have so many bear. Okay. I think in the I only hunted three days. I hunted three days and I was done. Um, it, it's a five day hunt, and that's the amount of bears that they have. It's just it, it's just really really densely populated with black bears. Um, so you know, being able to um, see 25 bears uh, in three days is, is a substantial thing. Mm. And, you know, and to see how, how these bears react when they're coming out of uh, hibernation and that kind of stuff, the, the bear, the, the, the first bear I shot actually, <laughs> this dude, he, he was sprawled out on the ground laying flat out and it was kind of army crawling across the grass. And he's just taking his head, turning his head side to side, and plucking fresh grass coming out of the ground. Just, he was just eating, and he was just crawling across the ground like a, I mean, he's like a living lawnmower, man. He's just mowing grass down. And he, he had no idea we were even there. We were able to sneak in. I think we took about a 160-yard shot. So it was quite cool. Um, we saw some, saw some moose, um, saw a few deer, uh, a lot of bird. I actually got to see... Uh, a really, really nice golden eagle. Nice. And I know how you are about mm -hmm. birds. And, and this dude, I mean, yeah, yeah, he was big. <laughs> Man, that thing was massive. That's the biggest uh, predatory bird in the world, huh? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think he is. I, I don't know that for certain, but I, I do believe that that is correct. But he was sitting, he was standing in a field just 30 yards off the side of the road. And we, we sat there and, and uh, just watched him. And I was so damn dumbfounded, I never even took a picture of it. Yeah. You know, he was so magnificent just to watch him sit there. And, uh, you know, the people were, the people in the area were just wonderful, wonderful people. Okay. Everybody was super helpful, mm -hmm. uh, ranches, farmers, all that kind of stuff around. Um, great outfit, had a good time. So that, that, that we're going to do the bear. Um, then we're fishing. I think, I, think uh, I, do, I got the fishing thing, like I said, in Idaho. That one's, that's sturgeon fishing. So, the guy says we should be able to do sturgeon. He said definitely do sturgeon. He said trout will be good. He said we should still be able to get some steelhead trout okay. about that time. So I'm hoping for that because I'd, I'd always like to catch a nice steelhead. Um, but I'm going after the sturgeon. The sturgeon is the one that I've always wanted to do a really nice sturgeon. Massive fish. Yeah, oh, boy. Prehistoric. You know, just absolutely beautiful fish. Um, but it's not indigenous yet to America. Eh? What is it? Oh yes, yes. Okay. Yep. And actually there's there's quite a few there's quite a few areas that hold sturgeon. Um and they're different in different areas. Uh I and I and I don't know enough about it. Again, I, I plan on educating myself mm -hmm. about this as I'm fishing this year. Uh, my uncle actually hunts or hunts G speed. He fishes sturgeon up on the rainy river of Minnesota. Okay. Um and it, it's a, it's a, it's still a very good sized sturgeon. It's not going to be, 
you know, these 12, 14 foot sturgeon and things like that, that you're going to see in the Columbia and the snake and all these different rivers. Um, but, uh, there's a, there's a good number of sturgeon, very good number of sturgeon. Um, you know, are they edible? They, they are edible. Um, smoked. I've heard that smoked sturgeon is phenomenal. This is a get catch and release only. Um, in the state of Idaho, you cannot keep a sturgeon. Mm -hmm. So, and rightfully so, they wiped them out. Yeah. They were trying to keep them, bring them back. So, conservation, you know, keeps that conservation thing going. But, um, and let's see, in June, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking something south of the equator. You know, see what's down down on the <laughs> underside. I don't really know what I'm going to do yet. Yeah. But uh, thinking something down there. Um, have some options. I have a I have an option to go to Australia. I have an option to go to Africa. Um, you got to weigh that out and see which way, what works best. Uh, Lily actually has a... She's in Junior ROTC or whatever they call it. So she's she's been invited to go to Washington, D.C. for nice. some conference. So mm -hmm. that plays into that mm -hmm. factor a bit. Um, other than that, then there's – we were looking at trying to do – we're going to do a, a little family trip the end of August over in – it's a cruise out of London. Um, uh, cruise out of London. Um that goes over to France, down around Spain, and back up to to London. So um, I was thinking about trying to put something together for Munjack, um, Chinese water deer, or, you know, roe deer, whatever, whatever would work. But yeah. so far, I haven't gotten enough figured out for that. So possibly a hunt on that deal. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I got to figure out cause I do have, uh, in, in scheduling, I kind of made a little bit of a bungle. I scheduled a cruise over top of a, <laughs> an antelope hunt antelope in New hunter. Mexico. So that, that <laughs> somehow I got to figure out how I can move the, the hunt. Um, so, Hey, Maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe I can't move that, and we can see who the conservationist is of the year, and they win a an antelope hunt in New Mexico from me. The pet man, I know we've got we've got dinner scheduled with Charlie in there. Yes, so uh, we need to take that into consideration. So, but once again, just it's always a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, and I love chatting to you. I mean. We, We've had four weeks of just some good, good chats and it is problem solving and and, and I love it. And uh, yeah, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for everything you've done for me. And um, yeah, I look forward to to having you on the podcast in the near future. Very, very, yeah. very soon. Yeah, we definitely. I'll definitely be back. Um, <clears throat> one way, shape, or form. We'll yeah. We'll do another one this year. Um, and bring up some more topics of what's out there and what's about there. But yeah. in the meantime, you know, the only thing I can say to, to the people out there in Podland, you know, seriously, man, you know, stop, stop, stop yeah. fighting with, am I off? Yeah. 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 Keep that. Yeah. Okay. So stop, stop fighting with each other. Yeah. We've, we've got, we've got a big enough fight in, trying to preserve our way of life. So stop fighting with each other. Come together. Let's let's save let's save the hunt. Let's save the hunter. Let's save the animals. Mm. Let's have fun. Let's educate each other. Let's love one another. Carry on. Yeah. My friend, thank you so much. All right, buddy.